So I got to sit down with the developers of Defend the Night and do an interview and it was very awesome. There's a lot of information in here that you're really going to enjoy and it's a game that if it isn't on your radar it should be. And most excitedly for me is they did mention during this interview that they'd like to get me in the game playing with them and I can present that content to you guys and give you a better understanding of the game specifically a low level dungeon that they've been putting a lot of hard work in that sounds very promising. But let's not waste any time let's listen to this interview and see what kind of information we can glean about this upcoming dark fantasy mmo rpg defend the night first of all if you guys don't mind if we could just go around everybody kind of introduce yourself and i know i know you guys probably wear multiple hats but if you could maybe give description of what your uh, job on the project is or if you have a title or anything like that just kind of gives people an idea of who each of you are with the development team okay do i actually have a title you do a lot of things. Um, I feel comfortable with you being a GM, and I feel comfortable with you being uh, involved in the lore, because you do a lot of the lore writing already. So, yeah, I was, I was going to say designer, so there's three. <laughs> yeah, and the design. Game designer's probably good. But yeah, I think Brian should start. He's the main poncho. Yeah, I don't I don't really have an idea on a title either. So I, I, I'm Brian. I'm, uh, I guess, call me uh, the lead developer. I'm the programmer behind the scenes. Um, also the co-founder of uh, Ninja Loot Games, along with um, Scribbles. Um, so I've been working on this for about three years, and then we uh, sort of formalized things at the beginning of 2019 with Ninja Loot Games, um, and then started to quickly expand and uh, bring on these guys we're about to talk to and, and a few others. Hi, I'm Jesse, aka Scribbles. I, I'm a founder, of course, um, and I'm also an operations manager, and I do some of the art design here too as well, some character character design and things like that and looking forward to uh, talking to you tonight that's for sure hello i am pi uh, also known as brat and uh i am the current level designer for uh defend the night and i was a big part of the pantheon community and mmos for a long long time but that's how i got to know uh lexer and everybody in the group and i kind of expressed what my dream job was which is basically level design and showing off a lot of my creativity and uh had a good opportunity to join the team and it's worked out excellent so far so i'm having a great time i'm lexer a lot of people probably know me from voices of terminus or the pantheon community as well i'm a game designer pretty much jack of all trades just float around do what I can to help. I'm not going to say my real name because no, no one uses it. That's everybody. Did we go through everybody? Okay. All right. All right. Okay. Well, good. Um, Does anybody want to do it again? <laughs> yeah, that's the big thing with us, man. If you, if you, I mean, if you can code and everything, that's great. But can you do it with passion? Can you get in there and and uh, just run with your you know feet to the floor and go as fast as you can? Yeah. To worry about. Well, I mean, look at let's look at the gaming industry for a minute. We're kind of at a tipping point here, not just in the MMO genre, but in general. Mm -hmm. And the reason indie developers are becoming so commonplace is because they do have the passion. They're going away from this is something to just make money, and they're bringing it back to this is an art, form. this is a passion project, this is something that we love. And you can really see it in what they do. Yeah, and just in the past five years or so, it's really become a possibility with the the technology that's available there as well. I mean, if you look at look at the open source engines, or look at the you know more the more accessible engines like Unreal and Unity, and what can be done in those, especially today, um, and you know especially how they've evolved over the last two or three years to to sort of start to rival what AAA studios can do in their engines. I mean, it's just incredible what. You know, somebody sitting in their home that has no studio, no funding, what they can actually churn out. Yeah, and and it's almost uh, I've seen a lot of people uh, kind of talking about that type of thing, and they're uh, kind of saying it's like a it's almost like a, a revolution of the gamers themselves trying to take their industry back, kind of kind of way. Well, guys, it's an honor to get to sit down with you guys for a little while and talk to you a little bit about this game. I, I want to start out because I know you guys are building a world. Uh, you know, you're not. You're not just building some connected zones with some stuff to do. You're you're creating an actual world, and uh, so I want to talk about that a little bit first. Can you guys talk a little bit about how large you want the world to be, or a game you could compare it to, or something like that? So this is Pi. One of the things. So I was inspired by EverQuest. Obviously, I played that game on and off for 11 years. It, you know, I often think back and I go, "What was it that you know got me to play EverQuest for so long?" And, some of it might have been, you know, there was really only one 
3D game out, you know, back in 99, 2000. But I even continued playing when WoW came out and all these other games. So to me, um, the nostalgia, you know, the fact that the world in, in the dungeons, especially in EverQuest, I still don't see anything out there that matches the dungeon style that EverQuest had. And the style, when I say style, it's the layering, the multi-pathing, you know, all kinds of rare mobs, name mobs. Uh, the skill it takes and the aggro control and all that kind of stuff that it's really not existent anymore. So when you think of a modern day dungeon, you're really running through in like 15 or 20 minutes and it's very linear and you start from point A and end up at point D and it's, you know, that's it. You fight the name bosses along the way and you're done with it. And, and honestly, when you're done, I don't think that people really think back and think about the the world itself while they were in there. Uh, it didn't really have an impact. Where if you look at EverQuest, a lot of those zones had an impact on you. I think that's why it just sticks with you. Um, everyone talks about running from Kanos to you know East Common uh, tunnels, or you know going through Kithikor or things like that, because it, it just it's a memory and it's an actual world that you spend time in. So. Going back to the world size, so it's going to be, you know, a lot of the zones, I think Brian had said it before, when you look at it in Unity, uh, a lot of the zones are 3,000 you know, by 4,000, some of them are 2,000 by 2,000 kilometers, so it's it's pretty big worlds. Nice. I like that. And when I when I think about it, just, just and you'll be seeing it here in the near future, which I'm really excited about, take uh, Seditious Sanctum, our new... It's a, it's a level 5 through 16 dungeon, so it's a, one of the first dungeons that players will get to experience. And uh, when you look at this dungeon, again, it's going to be very, very similar to what you would expect in some of the old EverQuest dungeons. Of course, with a modern twist, but it's going to be multi-layered. It's going to have paths that hook up all over the place. You're, as a designer, I still get confused on what goes where, which I think is great. It just shows you how complex it is. And, you know, even within that dungeon, there's going to be different environments and cool things and, you know, reasons to be in there. And I, I don't think anyone is going to spend 30 minutes in there. They're going to be spending literally weeks in there. Ooh, I like uh, it. That would be my anticipation. So that's what we're building. We're building worlds that you can get immersed in, which I think is kind of missing. And, you know, create memories and difficulties and, and leaders can stand up and lead people and be proud of the fact that they need, you know, they can get around and, and they know where they're going and stuff like that. So, so anyway, so that's, I know I spoke a long time on that, but that's important to me as a builder uh, and not just with that zone I'm, I'm going to be shooting for all the zones to have that kind of unique to it. okay i love it so the the dungeon you're talking about that kind of gives us a very good kind of uh, perception of what what you guys are shooting for uh this is uh this is a low level dungeon with this day and age uh when you go into a, a lower level dungeon in a, a newer mmo it's uh very short it's a very quick experience um you're in and out uh maybe you play it over and over again for experience but you're definitely not spending a lot of time in there to actually explore or because you want to be in there because it's awesome returning to that kind of roots of like this is a cool place uh, that you look forward to going to that you hear about and then you get to go in and, and really deep dive and explore get lost in it multiple parties within the same dungeon because this correct me if I'm wrong sounds like it this is uh, not gonna be an instanced dungeon right this is uh, open dungeon right that's right this will be open beautiful yep there'll be other players running around in there you know not just you and your group i love it and, and i love that experience too because you know you end up in several several parties sometimes several different group makeups you know people leave people join you go in sometimes maybe you can't find a group you hang out near the entrance of the zone or inside the zone uh, you play around some stuff that you can kill or, or what have you, and you wait for groups to have openings. Um, it's just all part of the to the fun to me, and you, you make a lot of friendships, and uh, you build your reputation, uh, in my opinion, a lot in these dungeons. Yeah, for sure. And and something else that, that you touched on was like going in at level five, and you mentioned you know really looking forward to going in there and it not just being some short thing, like in you know other games you might see a early dungeon probably not even that early they might you know, hold your hand up to like level 10 or something and then once you finally do go on a dungeon it's not necessarily this big experience that 
you know that that you really feel something for it's more of oh i've got two quests to check off my list so let me go in here real quick and then i'm done and that's it right uh that's not that's not what we're going for and 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 talking about going in at level five like i said we're, we're not really wanting to hold your hand uh in the lower levels either we want a good new player experience but we feel like and we feel like we can you know get people acclimated to the game and, and understand what it's all about and then we want to really get them into the game we don't want people to have to wait and you know spend hours and hours maybe even hundreds of hours getting to max level and then they're like okay now we can really experience the game now we can really do some some cool content no we we expect players will pick it up and can can uh you know function and understand what they're doing enough to go into some difficult content right away basically um, and th those early dungeons are not going to be a joke. They're, you're going to have to have some strategy and you're going to have to think on your feet. And um, I, I think players will appreciate that because we don't, we don't see it too much anymore. Yeah, and, and it sounds like you guys are putting a lot of love and care into this very first dungeon experience. And it also sounded possibly like you said, I'm pretty sure I heard you're excited to get me in there. Is that, is that what I heard? <laughs> I would love to get you in there. I would love to be in there. Yeah, well, let's, let's put it this way. We're excited to get everybody in there. Yes, yeah. I love that answer. So true. And I'd like to uh, advance on, on the gear aspect, too. So you'll have gear that you'll have in these dungeons of uh, mobs that you'll have to have to advance through the dungeon. So that's going to be a big thing. So you won't just be rolling in there just killing mobs. You'll have to think about what you're doing. You'll have to approach uh, these different mobs in different areas to outfit your group with different items that will advance you through the dungeon. So this yeah, so we, we can't say too much on that. That'll be released later. Right. Uh, yeah. As I was saying earlier, within those dungeons, there's um, different requirements as well. So there's going to be a lot of meaning of why you would spend time in there, you know, upgrading or you know, getting drops and finishing quests, obviously the, all those reasons that bring you in there. But I wouldn't expect to be able to do it in 30 minutes. You know, you're going to going to take you I, I i feel and i hope it takes you weeks to really understand it and be able to um you know live in each one of those areas within the dungeon like you were saying before we can't again we can't really say but you're going to have to work at being able to hit every area within there and would it be fair to say that this this first dungeon experience that's where you're going to probably uh, a new player, somebody who, or, or the the skill level, that's where you'll have to learn basic, probably group mechanics, how to pull, how to split, split pull, uh, all those kind of things that you um, need to know as the game progresses. I'm assuming this dungeon kind of sets the pace for that. Uh, so that's where you, where a new player, somebody that's not played an MMO like this, would probably learn those kind of oh, tactics, yeah. right? Yeah, we're going to rely on the community to help them out too. Um, your, your game is only as good as the community is, so we're trying to do that community right, um, trying to promote a positive attitude, and maybe that, that'll carry on to new players, and um, the old players can help them out. I love it, yeah. And, and that, That's not to say that if you go into a dungeon, you are going to have to go in with experienced people. Right. You could potentially go in with you know, people who are new to the genre. It's the full group of them. Yeah. Because it's going to be, you know, we, we've all been there. We've all been new. Yeah. And the yeah. problem with a lot of these, a lot of the newer games is that they either go really hard one way or the other. You know, it's either they expect you to be an expert or it's so easy. Anyone who knows what they're doing falls asleep. Yeah. But we're, we're real big on that gentle curve, especially at the low levels. Not so much the high levels because you should know things by that. But the first dungeon, just as an example, maybe the mobs aren't so space, or, or, aren't so tightly packed. Maybe we don't have so many patrols, but you get past a couple packs of them and you'll notice that things will start becoming a little more challenging as you go in. Yeah, I like it. Um, well, I could definitely, we could probably do a whole interview just talking about dungeons and dungeon design, but <laughs> that's my favorite thing. But um, this uh, this game, from my understanding, it's a it's an open world type game. It's a zone based, but it's it, it's an open world type experience, right? Yeah, we'd like to call it a sand park, if, if that's a, I like that's it. a thing. <laughs> it is now. It's like a little bit of the theme park and a little bit of the, the open world, so sandbox type. But it's it, it relies a little bit on the survival. We have a little bit of survival element, but not, not overly survival based. Oh, okay. Um, so what we'll have, you know, things like, well, you'll have to have food to, to gain mana, things like that. 
Okay. Wow, oh, bad. Okay, I like that. Are there are there points of interest in the world? Yeah, absolutely. There? You're you're going to see points of interest in uh, from the player cities to uh, NPC run cities, um, and you know as well as some smaller camps, uh, smaller NPC installments throughout all of the zones. Basically, I mean, there's there's going to be points of interest. You're not you're not just going to walk into a a forest that has some some wandering mobs and that that's about it or if you do it, it would only be um you know a, a select few uh, maybe but but there's going to be certainly points of interest and in, in things happening in these zones that that we hope make it feel makes it feel alive and it's not just uh you know we didn't just drop 20 mobs in an area and put them on a random path and say hey we have a zone you know there, there's a lot more going into it than that good to the hear the other thing is is we hope in time that uh you know because you're spending so much time in some of these zones um that you know you start get some of these landmarks or points of interest start becoming like these common tunnels you know, i hate saying that but yeah. you know our game would have these points of interest that stick and uh that you know you're calling out when you're meeting up with people and come up with these terms the community does and that's what we're excited about is that the community names it they create their own maps and they do things and it just starts to dynamically develop itself which is great yeah and that's some of the more memorable parts is when the players make decisions using it could be points of interest or, or what have you um where like the like the tunnel right uh where people decided that's where they were going to do their commerce and their selling and that wasn't designed by the developers uh, that was just where the players were like it's a decent you know point for us to all get together meet up and uh buy and sell and uh, nobody's ever going to forget that that was uh, around for that i've always yep. i've always loved that man that's like the best reference ever because of how important it was and all, all all the older mmos had things like that in my opinion maybe not to that i feel like that's kind of the extreme example but i played them uh, back then just about every mmo had something like that people came up with names they had meeting spots at points of interest and i actually believe a lot of that had to do with the mapping systems of back then can you guys talk a little bit about how you guys are planning on doing you know in-game maps for players to see so that one we're i would say we're not totally decided on um okay. just yet i mean i think we're certainly not wanting to uh you know just lay out some some beautiful map for, for people right away that you know where everything is and there's no sense of exploration no we, we want you to find it yourself and remember you know points based on experience um, but that's not to say that, you know, we don't want some convenience items like possibly a mini map that has a fog of war or something. You know, you can see places you've already been, th things like that. So I think that's something we haven't uh, focused on a whole lot yet. I think we have an idea where we're headed. But that's, uh, I don't know if, you, if anyone else has, has strong opinions on that. I know this is a discussion we've had, but we haven't really, uh, like I said, really come to a, a strong conclusion on it. I would say no, from a design perspective. One person. of my things, and, you know, we all have strong opinions and we do share as a team and we, we're very good about coming up to a common solution. But I'm definitely for no hand-holding. I like the fact, I miss the days bringing out a notepad and mm -hmm. it, it, just something about immersion when you're creating your own maps and identity about things you've dis discovered. And when it's done for you through the UI or something like that, it, it's just completely different in my opinion. So I'm sure it's going to be uh, somewhere in between, but hopefully leaning toward, uh, you know, where you'd have to bring out that notepad again. Yeah, I had a, a, a common group of people that I used to play uh, EverQuest with, and uh, a lot of us played some other games together, but we used to have the, the our healer map out for us so we wouldn't get lost and we could get back. <laughs> we, the healer, that was like her job, and she would have graph paper, and she would literally, like, map out as we were exploring that way we could just explore to the, our heart's content and not worried about getting lost um so i, yeah, I agree with you lost half the fun <laughs> and it also brings in fear and our game is yeah. gonna have a lot of scary moments so it's, that's what we want is you, you have to be prepared and if you get lost it brings in that fear factor and guess what you know you, you could die and that's that's part of the game so it's it's good it's gonna have uh, hopefully some good meat and and that's a, i'm glad you said that because um that that's kind of what i pull from the um kind of thematic of what you guys are going for is you want this to be a very heavily dark fantasy world you want this to be not a happy 
Bambi in the forest kind of experience, but you want this to actually be like a kind of a tense kind of kind of feeling. It's going to be dark and adult themed. Um, not adult themed like it's going to have you know nudity or anything, but it's going to be a little darker. And we're going to have fantasy high you know high fantasy elements too. So it's not it's going to be for a lot of different people. Okay. Um, like yeah. Right now. Well, that brings me actually. I was going to say something. I realized that that kind of brings a good question up. So, uh, let's talk a little bit about, at least to the uh, extent that you can, about varied landscapes or what kind of systems you're uh, going to put in the game to kind of promote exploration. And what kind of different, you know, varying different landscapes and zones you're you're kind of going for. I'll, yeah, I'll start. And just so what I was getting ready to say with what we were just talking about is you're right on on dark fantasy but that doesn't mean there's there's not also going to be some uh, you know some more I guess pr- pretty environments you know you're, you're going to have um, some areas that are maybe a nice uh, calm looking coastal area or a, a um, a forest that isn't quite so uh, uh, infested looking as, as some of the others but um, I think when we say dark fantasy it's not only just some of the art that we're going for with the mobs and the environments but it's also in the lore um, and we've we've put some of that up on the site we have a lot that we haven't shared yet um, but I think that's that's what really sort of rounds out uh, the, the style that we're going for and that will that will start to become apparent as we release more of the lore um, but as far as the just the, the climates and the, the variation in the environment, you're going to see a little bit of everything. Um, if you look at our map or if you look at um, some of the, the recent images we've been putting out of some of the zones we've been working on, um, you, you, can see, you can see a lot of different um, art already um, that have gone into the game. So you, some tundra environments already, some thick forests. Um, like uh, Pi was saying, already working on on our first dungeon. That's sort of a cavernous uh, area in the mountains. Um, we've been working on a desert environment already. Some coastal areas. Um, we have some. Obviously, if you if you look at the map, you, you can see certain areas that are um, you know more of a graveyard or, or uh, sort of a haunted looking areas. So there's going to be a little bit of everything. Um, so we hope you know people people will really explore and um, you know find. That they that they actually want to see all those areas on the map, and it's not redundant at all. You're you're exploring totally new things when you walk in a new zone. I like it. So um, sounds like I will be able to actually play as a beautiful, shining in the light armored paladin after all. Yes. All, all, all that I'll say to that is that yes, but that sure makes you an easy target. <laughs> All right, well, being an easy target definitely brings me to the next question I'm going to need, which is guilds. Based on everything I gather from this game and our conversation so far, it definitely sounds like this game is heavily, you know, a community-driven type game. So uh, I assume, uh, based on everything I've read, there's definitely going to be guilds in the game. Uh, but can and I know this is a topic, you know, uh, a little probably hard to go into full detail, but as of this point right, right now, what can you guys tell us about the guild system? Uh, I can hit this one. Uh, this is if, uh, a feature that is still under heavy discussion. Understood. But I'll just, I'll approach this with more of what I envision a- as a designer. I've played almost every game under the sun. And to be honest, most guilds are just glorified chat channels. Yeah. They will give you buffs or extra housing or some extra storage as an incentive to be in a guild. But it's kind of the, the end of it. You mean you can go from one guild to the next and there's really nothing to really stop you and you don't get an emotional connection unless you get to know the people. So I kind of see guilds as more of like a mercenary company. You're all out for number one and there's nothing wrong with that, but coming together with a common goal means that you can share experience. Because we're going to have some focus on PvP and player cities and the like, to me it makes sense to have a guild dedicate themselves to a particular city. And what this would do would give them some sort of benefit. It would give them a reason to heavily invest in this town. If it were a player-run city and it was under siege, the guilds who use this town as their base of operations are going to want to defend it for obvious reasons. No one wants their home track. And what we're trying to do is we're going to give people something 
that is familiar, but we're trying to take it a little further than everybody else so that we can try to give people a better experience overall. I like it. So. Yeah, and, and we we mentioned uh, poss- you know having some survival like elements. Now that's that's not to say that we're we're going to in any form be a survival game. You know, we're not at full loot, having wipes monthly to refresh the map, no, that kind of thing. But um, I do see that kind of playing into the guilds as well, where. You know, if you think about uh, what a guild or just a you know a, a group would be in a survival type game, where they're actually um, roaming around together, protecting you know protecting landscape, protecting their their homesteads, um, more of that kind of gang of bandits. I, I kind of see that being more of a thing here than just people like Lexer said, or who are just hanging out in their chat channel and maybe never even come face to face with their characters. I, I think uh, that's going to be a little little different for us because of the city aspect yeah and it does uh so you know i'm envisioning uh as you guys are talking like uh people going out and actually going out in the world and harvesting or or even killing monsters for hides and bones or you know different things that they could bring back to their guild and use in some sort of way for the city. Does that sound something along the lines of what you guys are thinking? Yeah, that, that's perfect. That's a perfect explanation of it. Um, we definitely we definitely want the players that could be the, in the guild or uh, just a regular civilian in the city uh, go out in the world and bring back stuff for their society to advance their society or a city in that region. So I, I think that you hit the, uh, the nail on the head. You know, that kind of actually, uh, in my opinion, sounds like it could play out to actually be a type of end game, right? It doesn't have to wait to the end of the game. You, you, you know, I don't mean that. I'm just saying uh, something that when you've you're, you've hit max level, you've seen the zones, you've you know you've conquered the dungeons. You're just uh, you know this would be an activity. Uh, sounds like yeah, to this me. Is, this is definitely horizontal progression. Yeah, I love um, it. Something else to do. A lot of di- diplomacy is going into it, and a lot of just just caring about your community. So you're going to care about you're gonna, we're going to try to make you care about your neighbor. So okay, it's going to be yeah. different. And that that's exactly so. What Scribbles had said about being a sand park. I mean that that's what we're talking about. So of course we want to have some developer uh, generated content uh, like a you know a typical theme park game would. Um, we want to you know create some fun content for people, but we also want there to be things in the game where you know players can kind of make their own content and make their own. Uh, you know, pl- player versus player interactions, or, or other other things that can keep you involved in the game, even when some of that uh, content may dry up as you you know as you get to max level and, and have run all the dungeons 50 times. Like we still envision there will be lots of things to do in the world because of those sandbox elements, even if you're waiting on new content from the devs. Yeah, and all the things I said, I would like to mention. Um... You know, you've beat all the dungeons, you've explored all the zones. Uh, anybody listening, I'd also like to point out that that would be a pretty monstrous feat based on uh, the the intricacy, the intricacy you guys are designing dungeons, etc. Uh, that wouldn't just be something like you got to max level, so you've seen the dungeons and been inside them, so you've mastered them. Uh, each dungeon oh, would take no. a long time to feel like well, you've mastered. I'm, I'm not a level designer, but I do pay very close attention to what what pie does and let me just spill a little bit of beans for you guys <laughs> he is a big fan of hiding things oh yeah i actually had a comment down uh so don't be surprised uh and i'll just let it out now i think we uh, don't be surprised that there's going to be illusion walls don't be surprised that Ooh. there's going to be traps that you fall into and you need your group to help you get out um, oh i love if it ring, if, if the fallen <laughs> rings a bell uh, all those kind of things, you know, spring traps, uh, all these things that in, in time you will get down, but, you know, it could be quite frustrating. It's a, it's a great kind of frustration when you're learning. Yeah. Um, and and you're, you're trying to beat it. So it's just not this basic run through the trash mobs kind of thing. You have to think about every corner you take, and that that's really the goal, or at least every other corner, right, Brian? That's right. Um, I heard you mention illusion walls, which I'm a huge fan of, uh, but even scarier, illusion floors. <laughs> there are those. Two. I love it. I love yep. it. That's some or, very or, or scary underwater memories. Underwater passages that are there, hidden. There's underwater passages. There's, the, there's the things. Or something. I will be confident to say that 
a lot of people might play through and not discover everything and we're okay with that there's right. a lot of those little gems out there but if you're talking to your friends and your community you might hear about something now all of a sudden you want to go check it out and try to find it you know you guys can remember some of the zones in guck that required quests and epic drops and things they were very tough to find underwater and things like that it's it's very similar there's going to be a lot of there, there's a lot of all i can say is it's, it's not the standard dungeons that you can go from point a to b it's, it's not a run and gun dungeon and, and and designing it that kind of way um the really cool part is like you said uh you may have you may have think thought you've seen it all and then you're talking to somebody and you're like yeah i'll run through that dungeon with you and then that person who maybe hasn't even been in the dungeon as long as you tells you something you didn't know and that's a really cool moment you're like i did i had no idea about this 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 passage here or whatever you remember when uh, i know we're going off on nostalgia here but that's it's kind of the cool part. you remember when and i think brian and i were talking about this the other day in guck you would go in there just to farm shin armor because it was black and it was cool looking yeah that's the other kind of thing that another hidden element i don't think that's really out there another reason to exist in somewhere or some portion of the world where we'll have cool things like that that only drop there and it makes it unique so again something it might appeal to some people and not others and that's you guys have a very a very awesome grasp of what makes mmo great or mmo rpg so great and so much fun to explore so i do want to move on because Here's, I think I maybe made a mistake. When I was talking about this game, I, I referred and I kind of mentioned another game uh, and, and said that your all's project reminded me of it, and that was dealing with PvP. Uh, so I do want to definitely touch on this because I don't want to misrepresent what you guys are building. Uh, so could we talk a little bit about PvP before we go full deep in PvP, actually? guilds so can you talk a little bit about pvp how it works um and kind of also integrate how maybe a major ridiculous guild might impact pve or pve or pvp and um you know a generalization of what the pvp sh is going to feel like in this game in terms of like large very powerful guilds the first thing that most people do is they'll find some way to hold them back they'll cap the guild or whatever you know there's lots of things we've seen in the past we're of the mindset of you know we should never have to hold them back if you're big and you're powerful that's great but the thing is we as developers and designers we need to think of creative ways so that going after the little guy going after that easy win isn't really worth your time you want to push yourselves you want that that close battle so if i if i'm the guild leader of a, of a very large guild Sure, I can go after Scribble's Guild, who might have only 10 people, but I might not even, get, I, I might not gain anything. I might actually lose resources in the end because of what it's costing me to do. That's kind of the balance we're going for. We, we really want to balance the, the pros and cons so that we never have to grab somebody by the hand and tell them this is what you should be doing. But all the signs should point to this. This is really what you want to do instead of going for that easy win. Because out of every experience that anyone here has, be it PvP or PvE, we never remember the easy win. We always remember that, oh, you know, we were we were PvPing another guild and we were down to two people and they were down to two people and we won and our last guy was at 1%. Oh, do my God, do you guys remember that? You know, you can sit there and reminisce about that stuff for an hour. And that's that's what we're, we're hoping to send people. And if you force them, it, it loses its value. But if all the reasons point to the harder fight, people are still good. People are going to do it. With PvP in general, um, personally, I, 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 I play both PvP and PvE, but there are days where I don't want to deal with PvP. Some days I just want to take it easy, do my own thing. Maybe I want to run a dungeon. Maybe I want to hang out with some friends. Maybe I'm having a rough day and I just want to go Goomba stomp somebody. I always And I always lose respect for developers when they force a certain play style on people like say oh you know you you play a game in pve up till level 30 and then all of a sudden they swap it and now you have to pvp to make any progress to me that's not good design it's it's lazy it's taking just it's taking choices away from the people that you're supposed to be giving an experience so we're we're going for consensual pvp whenever there is an option to go pvp people will be notified clearly and those who choose to pvp are going to be rewarded for taking that extra risk because that's only fair i agree so um so 
if you don't, if because there's a lot of people um, who pro- I, I, I know out there who uh, they don't like PvP. So it is completely avoidable in this game. It's just if you decide to partake in it, there will be you'll obviously be rewarded for taking that risk of, of making yourself available to it, basically, right? Correct. And we're actually going to be doing our damnedest to make sure that PVE and PvP are intertwined to the systems of the game. So PVEers can still provide resources to their ally who are participating in the PvP. Oh, that's nice. So you could actually be a total PvE player, but be assisting in a PvP effort for your guild. Exactly. I like that. I like that. And, you know, the, the exact inverse is the, is true as well if i'm a pvp'er just the fact that i'm pvp'ing and holding this city or taking down an aggressive neighbor that's going to benefit the pve players just as much as a pvp player i like it a lot speaking on pvp siege warfare right so let me i kind of laid out a picture when i made my first video about this all right and i I think I might have been a little misguided. So let's talk a little bit about Siege Warfare, but also while we're, you're talking about that, if you could maybe uh, also explain how the building part of um, of building your own city or community or township or, or whatever it is that you're building and how the warfare would kind of play into your game uh, from, a, from a PvP perspective. Like can people just come demolish your town? I guess what I'm looking for. Sure. So I'll I'll start with that, and I'll, I'll just say these are these are parts of the game that, as we've um, you know, what we focused on so far with core systems, with um, as we're getting into some of our level design, these are things where we've held, held you know held numerous design sessions and brought in players from our community for roundtables, and we have a good idea of our design. But th- these are still maturing. We're still uh, you know based on some feedback, we've already changed some things, and I think. You know, Nathan, you said you might have misspoke. I, I think you probably just read some things that were older on our site that we, you know, we've taken feedback and discussed and decided maybe to go uh, a little bit different way or alter, you know, what we initially thought. So, so that's on us to sort of uh, sort that out and and uh, you know get it a little more firm uh, and a little more be a little more I, I guess open with with our answers than what we have today. So once we are there, um, you know we'll certainly let people know what that path is. But just on our philosophy and what we've designed so far, I'll say that just in general PVP, we're we're not looking at open PVP everywhere where a PVE player is going to have to be constantly be worried about getting ganked. Um, we're not we're not incentivizing um, you know Zerg versus Zerg combat where you know you're basically just forced to follow uh, uh, 50 people around just just killing whoever as you go zone to zone and that's the most efficient way to get your PVP exp- experience uh, or your your rank or whatever. So that that's what you got to do. Um, those those just aren't fun experiences, and that that's 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 not what we're going for. Um, or even just you know roaming around with a gang squad and, and killing people who are leveling that present absolutely no challenge. That's not what we're looking for. We're looking for situational PvP, um, like like Lex or said, you know, consensual PvP, where it's it's with a purpose. Um, and and like you touched on, Nathan, maybe that's maybe that's a, a city siege where you're. You know, you have um, a homestead of your own that you're protecting against other players. Maybe you have a shared homestead of some sort um, with your guild um, that you're protecting with other players. Or maybe it's just it's a it's a large city that uh, multiple guilds are vying for, um, or maybe one guild takes over and they're having to defend from others or defend from um, players of uh, that have sort of built a, another faction against that city. Those are the sorts of the sorts of uh, PVP encounters we want. We we don't want uh, it, it's not something we're just going to slap on at the end of development and say, "Okay, we've you know we've made this uh, PVE all, all of our PVE content, so now let's just uh, make the spells be able to hit other players." And there you go, we've got PVP. No, that that that's not it. We we want specific scenarios um, that are going to be fun, and and maybe that's even things you queue for, like like battlegrounds where um, you know players that don't ha- necessarily have the time to jump in and play. Uh, you know, find a group and go through a three-hour dungeon run. Maybe they can jump into a queue and play some sort of uh, controlled PvP encounter that's that's fun for 30 minutes or 60 minutes, and they gain a little experience. Maybe gain some some uh, faction with their city that they're that they're representing or something like that, and then they can you know go about their day, but actually feeling like they've made some 
some uh, real progression in a short play period. So I know that's something that, that especially people like ourselves that are still into MMOs, uh, that are, uh, you know, have a family and kids and a job. And I think that's something that's very appealing to, to those of us that uh, are in that situation. Yeah, and my one comment is I'm probably a very picky PVPer, so I know I've had, had some input on uh, some of the PVP goals but so with me i'm i'm a moody player and what i mean by that you know it's real life jobs whatever mood i'm in can change from night to night and pvp can absolutely ruin a mood for me so like when i want to immerse myself in some kind of hey let's say it's fishing uh let's say it's maybe i want to run a dungeon maybe whatever it is i don't want pvp to come along and completely ruin that moment for me because I have two or three hours, maybe some nights, and I want to go in and get that immersion, get my mind off things, have a good time. And I think sometimes if you build it wrong, that wrong PvP moment can absolutely ruin someone's experience. So and on top of that, I do like P PvP when I'm in the mood for it. So it would be more, more or less strategy type situations that you can queue for, um, you know, something very... I would say strategic and uh, dynamic would be a good word. Something that's not doesn't repeat a lot, where you have different results. Those are the kind of things that excite me. To, to answer a little bit on like, will your town be wiped out? I think while we don't have an exact idea right now, it's pretty safe to say that having a large, let's say there's five tiers to city. If you had a tier five, you get siege and it gets wiped out. That's that's while realistic is pretty harsh to people because we want cities to feel like a major community accomplishment in a lot of respects. So I think it's safe to say that you will be set back for sure. I mean, if, if a car drives through your, your living room, it's going to set you back. <laughs> but also to address the, the website information, I think it's actually a little bit of a testament to this team because we did, we sat down one night, we brought in, it was an open invitation to members of our, of our, of our community to talk about PVP and such. And while we don't have anything set in stone just yet, we have clearly altered our course slightly because we took the input from our fans and instead of disregarding them and assuming our way is always going to be best, we took a step back. We considered everything that was said to us and we decided, yeah, a lot of these points are really good. So let's see what we can do to alter course and get somewhere where they're going to be happy and we're going to be happy. Yeah, I mean, that, that's a that's a great point. I mean, we, especially as a small team, we we put questions out there all the time. I mean, if, you, if, if you're in our Discord, um, you know, you'll constantly see questions from Scribbles, bringing up design questions and just d throwing out different things to, to the community to see what people are thinking. Um, and we do take it seriously. Uh, we're not just fishing for likes on Twitter or something when we throw that out there. We, we really do uh, care what you have to say and it's already impacted our design. Um, and you know we're still early, like we've said. Especially some of these some of these systems that aren't, um, you know, they're not necessarily core systems to how the game functions. It's not like a PvP is not an inventory system. It's not required to run the game. So it's it's something that we haven't. Uh, th that's not as complete as those other core systems yet. Um, so you know, as we do sort of finalize those, we're, we will continue to take community feedback, and it and it may. You know our, our ideas may shift a little more from here but um you know with that said I, I do think we've we've got enough of a design perspective to know um about where we're, we're going with it um we just don't want to you know put out anything definitive until uh, we're a little further along yeah totally understandable i think that was really great answers i think that kind of that kind of puts it in a really good perspective uh as far as what people can experience uh, playing the game. I never played PvP until Dark Age of Camelot, and that's when I realized it could be fun. Uh, they had a very interesting system there. I gotta say that there's not a lot of options for PvP players where uh, they can have a meaningful experience. Uh, you know, having open PvP can be fun, uh, you know, it can be dangerous, uh, but like you said, there are nights or times where you just want to do something specific and you know if you're trying to fish like you mentioned earlier and you keep getting ganked i mean that's just no fun for anybody right like 
the PVPers aren't even having fun either farming you coming back and trying to get your fishing rod out. So nobody's having fun in that kind of situation. I think you guys are on the right path and I know you're still working on that, but it sounds like you guys are putting a lot of thought into it. You, you understand yeah, we, the basics, so. Yeah, we need to PVP for a purpose. I think that's what we're trying to uh, establish. I love PVP. It's, it's one of the staples in my, in my gameplay. So I am concentrating on it. Um, a lot but i want to make it enjoyable for everyone if we can give that pvp player a good reward for pvping and um give that pv player <clears throat> um his own space sometimes when he needs it i think that's what we're heading for okay I think that'll be turn out great yeah, yeah. And just, just this so, sorry uh, just just to smash that point of because this is a question we constantly get I, i've seen it everywhere every every time we mention anything about pvp even when we don't um, we, we see the question, well, if I, am I going to get ganked? Or if I'm, if I'm pulling a boss, am I, you know, somebody going to just come up and ruin my group's, you know, my group's pull, uh, backstabbing. No, that's, that's, that's not going to happen unless it's a very specific scenario where you know, that's a possibility for some reason, you, you know, you've accepted a quest where that is a, that is a risk on top of you know that uh, fulfilling the quest you also may have to worry about other players for some some reason but in general no that's not that's not like scribble said that it's that's not fun for anyone right it, it might it might you know you might get a laugh out of it if you're the the pvp -er, uh <laughs> ruining someone's experience you know pulling the a, a, a boss but it's that's not really fun um and that's that's not something we're we're gonna allow Nathan, i was gonna ask have you ever played uh arcade I have um, not too seriously though, but I, I but I've definitely dabbled in it a bit, and um, uh, the PvP in that game I thought was fairly well done. Uh, it's got a purpose, exactly. you know. Um, it's part of the, it's just part of the game. It doesn't feel tacked on. It doesn't feel like it's just there to for people to uh, exploit. It, it's just part of the game, and it feels pretty natural uh, to me at least. PvP with a purpose, right? They got yeah. packets you're yeah. delivering. Yeah. Yeah, just the way they integrated um, PVE and PVP there, you know, I, I think if anything, I'm okay with that, right? Because you know there's certain zones that might require you to be out there, but you know that you have to put yourself in PVP mode. I'm okay with that. It's right. just that when you're trying to do meaningful stuff and you're someone's purposely trolling you, or, you know, those kind of situations, that's what we're trying to. And the challenge of the game is is important on that as well. I mean, if it, if you have a game that's not very challenging and and players are trying to gank you, well, you, you may be able to deal with it. But that's not what we're going for. We're going for a game where you know, if you pull a boss and you succeed, it's probably just going to be uh, it's probably just going to be uh, by the skin of your teeth, right? It, you, you barely made it. So uh, another player coming up and engaging your group is not going to be something that you really even have a chance. Right. Um, to endure so that yeah that that, that can't really happen uh, with that style of game I don't think now from what you guys said and I know we're you know you guys are in development here uh, so I know there's no guarantees or anything but it does sound like it's possible then you're in, in, in the game you guys are building that at some point there could be a dungeon where it's PvP and there's some really cool resources that would be really great for your city but it's PvP and you got to go in there and you got to try to get your resources and get out alive. Is that something? Does that sound like something that is possibly in the future of, the, of this game? Yeah, I'd say it's a hundred percent possible. <laughs> uh, and uh, and and the same with the you know, PVE players. Or there'll be some twists and turns. Uh, PVE is not going to be afterthought. Any afterthought as well. Uh, PVE players will. Uh, be able to aid their uh, fellow PVE players and PVP players um, helping and supporting their city. So um, let's say, so uh, I like that where like, let's say there's a there's a town, right? Uh, a player built town and there's another one nearby, right? And they decide to do some, uh, some commerce together, right? Uh, so I'm just making up things here. So nobody think this is actually 100% uh, part of the game. But you know, for example, let's just say one town they have a lot of people going out and harvesting lumber, right? Like they just have buku lumber, let's say. Well, the other town, they don't have a lot of harvesters, right? They're big on PVP. So the one, they can make deals, right? They could be like, hey, look, if you'll spare X amount of lumber to us, or at least at, at a good discount, we'll 
help you out with some of the PvP stuff that you might need, stuff, you know, areas you're having trouble with, and we can we can set up a system we can work together. Yeah, it's emergent gameplay as well, and we're all about that. We, we love that system, like the uh, East the East Common Land Tunnels, things like that, things where players want to uh, interact with their society. Yeah. Love it. All right, so that kind of brings us into talking a little bit about the building aspect, right, which is huge, I feel like, for your game. Um, and what you guys are, are, are creating here, uh, the the ability to be able to do that, I think, is uh, going to be a lot of fun and going to be something that uh, holds people's interest for a really long time. So can you tell us a little bit about building? And, and most importantly, my community really wanted to know, and I, I feel like you guys already answered it, but just to make sure and put it in concrete, if there's going to be resets or anything where you start all over once a month or once a quarter of the year or what have you. Yeah, so with resets, um, no, we're we're not that far into the survival genre. It's not, you know, it's not going to be uh, like Rust or something where you know you have uh, your your monthly server wipes or whatever it is, and you're back to uh, a naked guy running around the woods when <laughs> yesterday you were running around with the AK-47. It's, no, it's not going to be not going to be like that. Um, with the building systems, um, again, a, a, a later system that we have some. Um, I think some some really great design ideas for and some things that we've that we've started to look at and we, we've even started to develop our cities around um, but again it is fluent and um, I'll just say that we initially started this out and th this is some of the language on the site that um, probably is a little confusing and, and when you hear us say some things now you might think um, well they've, they've sort of changed their their approach and that's true um, and like we said, based on a lot of feedback that we've received and a lot of design sessions that we've, open design sessions that we've had and, and received some really great ideas, um, where we've kind of stepped back and said, you know what, it's not really feasible, um, especially if we become a quite large game, um, to, to have every single player essentially having the ability to, to own their own city, um, whether it's, just, whether it's in the open world or instance to own basically an entire city um, so if you're you know think about if you have thousands of players and you have thousands of cities they sort of lose their meaning at that point um, so we've kind of taken a step back and said you know it, at least for now I'll, I'll spill a little bit of the beans and say um, there will be some player cities there will be some NPC cities um, the player cities will uh, can be contested, like we said, sieged. Um, we're looking at diplomacy systems uh, for those as well, where, where players will really run those things. Um, but also some player homesteads um, in addition to those cities. Um, now, how those will actually work from a networking standpoint, um, be it you know, instanced or um, otherwise, uh, that we're, we're still kind of working through that design. I mean, I think we have some some great ideas either way um but we do want players to be able to if, if, for those that enjoy building and um sort of more of a tower defense style gameplay if you'd like to see that make its way into into an mmo i do think you're going to find uh find some enjoyment with, with what we have planned uh, we we absolutely want players to be you know uh, strategically uh trying to figure out you know how how can i best defend you know once i get the money to build a little homestead how can i best defend it from other players or uh, you know if i want to declare war on on uh, another city or another guild city or another, another player that i just don't like you know how can i prepare for that and what do i need to gather and and deploy uh, around my city to, to prepare so I, those are things that we we absolutely want to be a part of the game and, and we're just sort of uh, getting into that implementation stage very cool and you mentioned uh, uh, tower defense and uh, you guys have some videos on your YouTube channel which I'll put a link for in the description uh, where I saw uh, some some of that where you guys were showing how you can kind of lay out uh, mercenaries I believe is what it was called and uh, kind of set up for a uh, it looked like to me at least, and I don't know if that was just for testing purposes, uh, but it looked like you could set up for like waves of uh, PvE mobs and um, try to literally defend your place. Uh, so so you, were, you were way back in the videos with that one. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's a, 
that's a uh, um, absolutely so that that one that you're talking about was more of a um, probably more of like a battleground type scenario where instead of and instead of it just being you know sort of an arena of some sort um, having it be more of a tower defense type situation then like you said exactly where um, instead of I guess in a t- typical tower defense you're controlling some sort of builder um, unit and you're and you're building towers and just letting them do their thing well in this case you know your your character would be your builder but you're of course also fighting uh in that in that battle um and and the, having waves of enemies and and absolutely um so we think we think there's some really fun replayable tower defense type scenarios there that like you said we've we tested a long time ago that's probably been two years now uh but just to just to get the networking down and sort of a proof of concept but those are those are the uh type of things um yeah we would love to see and 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 whether that that could be both pve and pvp um you can have some some really fun pve tower defense scenarios as well it doesn't just have to be um you know, players on both sides of that battle yeah definitely uh that's very ambitious by the way uh, when i saw that i was like oh wow uh this is uh this is going to next level kind of a scenario so very cool and i think i think uh, a lot of people could find a lot of enjoyment out of that uh, i know i would uh especially i would be interested in that in a pvp scenario for sure I just wanted to comment too that um, one of the things we're we're bouncing around. I think Brian touched on this a little bit. We can't disclose a whole lot about it because it's kind of just a thought. And it's we were already thinking about like future expansions and where we're going with that. And I think we've come up with a, like some really cool ideas. So we're already thinking that far ahead as as, you know, as far as end game and how to keep the player immersed and. So I think we came up, and especially in regards to epic weapons or epic uh, epic items, we'll say, we're pretty confident those will be in the game as well. That will be pretty uh, drawn out quests and how that relates to like a future expansion or something like that. So everyone should get excited because I think there's some great ideas coming and how to keep players 100% immersed in the game, uh, even at any point. I wanted to bring up something um, because, uh, you know, I, I guess you guys, as developers, you have to constantly be thinking um, many, many years in the future as you're creating something for now. Uh, so I, I did want to just kind of bring this up. Have you guys thought of or um, do you have plans to kind of isolate or save the core vanilla experience for just in case in the future? There was a scenario where people are kind of like, hey, I would love to return back to the vanilla day and re-experience the game um, back from that point. And I, I see a lot of developers now, you know, they it's, a, it's hard because they have to basically recreate that experience. So is that something you guys have thought of or do you think that's really not yeah, necessary? I'm uh, from the, uh, I actually ran uh, emulators for many years, probably 10, 10, 12 years. So it's, it's one of those things that we're saving every client that we have uh, to, to go back to those early days. Um, so that's something that we're going to be looking uh, towards when we're developing. Yeah, and I don't, for sure. I don't mean to intend, intend to uh, kind of say that you guys are going to ruin your own game in the future. I'm just saying, you know, sometimes there's that demand no matter what. Like, I'd love to go back uh, and, you know, re-experience the game back back like it used to be. So that's... And- Good news. I think there's some those, some things down the pipeline that you'll be interested in too, but I don't think Brian wants to let that out of the bag yet. Yeah. Right, Brian? Yeah, I'll, I'll just say uh, I, I think we have some pretty original ideas that, that have maybe been teased in the genre before, but never really done to their full extent or anywhere close. Um, and uh, I... Yeah, just just keep an eye out because I I think um, we we don't really like to you know put I think we have, we have some really cool maybe even crazy ideas, but we don't just want to throw them out there like you'll see a lot of times on Kickstarter and things like that without actually prototyping them. We want to prototype something, prove it works, play you know play it and play through it internally, and really be confident in it before we throw it out there. So I'll just say that uh, you know I think we have a lot of great ideas like that and and keep an eye on on those especially you know over the next year or so and i, I think some of them will really make it out of that prototyping stage uh and and uh be pretty exciting yeah when you're a small indie a developer like us we need to keep our eye on the ball and uh a feature feature creep does happen so we need to uh limit ourselves a little bit so but we we are planning on things that are good 
uh, we just want to stay focused. Yeah, I understand 100%. Um, you know, uh, especially as a small developer team, I mean, there's probably so many ideas that you like to do, but you have to be reasonable uh, and you have to put on a timeline and that kind of thing. And uh, thankfully, I believe uh, the kind of uh, core community you guys will probably build just around the concepts of your ideas. I think, you know, I don't know if this is offensive to say or not, maybe you guys can let me know, but uh, we're, we tend to be an older crowd. Um, so we're not, uh, not to say younger people won't be interested, I'm sure they will. But um, I think a core audience of yours, uh, at least for me, my 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 group of community, uh, we're older and we kind of understand, you know, like we we kind of are like, well, I see the potential, I see the ideas here, and I can tell. A lot of times you're playing a game, you're like, I can tell where this could go, you know, and um, that, that's exciting just to see potential in, in in different mechanics and things. Can you talk to us a little bit about what type of monetization you're planning on going with with Defend the Night? The easiest way to probably approach that question is, you know, MMOs rely on population. And although free-to-play has a very bad stigma due to very poor developer choices in the past, being an indie studio, it's likely going to be one of the stronger candidates that we consider. Um, but that being said, you know, servers aren't free. Expansions aren't free. You know, Brian has to, has to, he's got to eat. Otherwise nothing gets done. So there's got to be, there's got to be an income and pie eats. And I mean, so income has to come in. Running an MMO is a business. Running a game studio is a business, but everybody here are gamers. I want to say old school gamers, but now you got me feeling old. So <laughs> I'm just going to say we're all gamers. We've all been bitten by the, the pay to win greed. So it's safe to say that should pay to win be the direction that's going to, that we feel is going to fit us best. <clears throat> you can rest assured that pay to win is going to be fought tooth and nail because there's not a single person on this team that wants pay to win for anybody. Yeah. Yeah, I think yeah, I think you meant the whole you, said, you said should pay to win be our direction. I, I think you meant free to play. Is what yeah, is that what you were saying? Yeah. Or, or, free to play. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So so pay to win, absolutely. You know, absolutely not. We're we're still in between um, models, and I think part of the reason for that is you know we're we, it's early on. We are a small team, and we just it, it's hard for us to gauge. I mean, at this point. Um, though we're, we're growing like crazy, just looking at our website traffic and our Discord channel, um, it's really hard to forecast what that interest is going to be like um, by the time we're looking at launching the game. And I think depending on that interest, that, that's going to guide the monetization of the game a lot. Um, if that interest is really high, much higher than and the player base we feel like is, is there regardless of what the monetization model is, I mean, I think most of us would agree that we've had the best uh, experience in subscription-based games. Yeah. Um, I have, for sure. Um, now, that's not to say you can't have a great experience in a free-to-play game, but I don't know, it, you know, if, if the, the audience is there to support a subscription-based game, I, I, I think that's a great model. Um, mm -hmm. If But if we feel like, um, you know, we need to attract more players with a free-to-play model, I think we have some good ideas of how we can do that too and keep it reasonable and obviously not go into pay to win type type mechanics or loot boxes or anything like that. I, I think there are ways that we can that we can make that work in a fair way as well. Um, so yeah, we're we're not really ready to really commit to one and, and in fact it might be a hybrid of, of several different systems. I mean, I mean it could be a system where um, a, a, you know, you could you could demo the game through ten levels, and then you know perhaps upgrade to a to a subscription of some sort. So um, yeah, it's, it's it's really fluent at this point. I mean, the main thing is we 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 don't want to screw people over. We're we're not looking to make billions of dollars like a, a AAA company here. We just want to support the game and keep it going. Yeah, and I think that there's an over criticism uh, today on payment models or monetization models for MMOs. Like you said, I'm totally down with the subscription. I'm, I'm down with buying the game, paying my subscription, buying my, uh, my expansions as they come out. I'm so happy actually uh, to spend money on a game that is devouring all my time, right? So when, I know when an expansion comes out, I'm, I'm eager to give them 
my money, right? Like I'm excited to say, here's you know whatever they charge. I love your game. Here you go. And I know I'm paying a monthly subscription, but here's you know I'm ha I'm happy to see the success of developers because they're making the game that I'm playing all the freaking time. So um, that's how I feel about it. But it, it, no matter what you do, it's a it's a catch-22 because there's going to be people complain, right? It's just impossible to please everybody. So I do not envy you guys for trying to work that out uh, at all. So yeah, here, here's one thing that I'm pretty confident in, and, and uh, I know this being a uh, a wise person of life, you know, meaning I'm a little bit older, is that uh, when you build something of quality, and again, no one on this team is really after money. That's not why we're doing this. You know, we're, we're doing it out of pure passion and based on gaming experience and what's missing in the market. You know, there's there's games out there pursuing kind of saying the same interest, but that's really why we're here as a team. And and I, I'm 100% confident you build something of quality and, you know, that's got the right elements in it and, and you charge what I consider or you find a way to, to pay for things and make it fair. It I think that's going to be a winning situation. I think that's you know, people will be drawn to it for the right reasons. And I, I can tell you what we absolutely will not do that's become a really unfortunate trend in, in this genre is become a game that basically has, and I said before, we, you know, we could have a hybrid model, but we're not going to have every model. There's too many games now that uh, they, sure, that okay, they might be free to play, but then you have to buy the expansion. And then, well, you can play the game, but you can't really play the game unless you spend $200, $300. And then, oh, by the way, they're also going to sell you loot boxes. Like, no, we're, we're absolutely not going to do that. We're going to pick something and stick with it, and it's and it's going to be... Um, uh, it, it's going to be reasonable. We're not. We're not going to decide. Uh, hey, we need to make some more money before the next quarter. So let's slap on another monetization system or, or hire a psychologist to figure out how we can squeeze some more money out of people. <laughs> that that's that's not what we're doing here. Yeah, I, I like this. So basically, you guys are you're not sure, but you're going to base your whatever structure you end up going with. What's going to be best for the actual game, not what's because um, you're building a world and you want people in it. You want people enjoying it and you want people to make communities in it and 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 that's that's the enjoyment you guys are getting out of it but of course there's bills to pay the servers have to stay up you gotta eat you gotta you gotta keep the lights on so um you know you're gonna figure out a, a happy place but you're not sure where that is yet until you can figure out where what will keep the players uh and not make them run away screaming i think the answer is more choices for the players if you have enough choices to cover everybody, I think it'll be best for everyone. But we're not we're not sure yet. Yeah, and and just uh, because this question comes up all the time is not only monetization of um, you know keeping the game going, but how are we going to actually get to that launch? Um, and you know, it's something that we're we're weighing options there. Um, I know most games in our situation end up going to a crowdfunding stage. Um, at some point, and that's that's something we're seriously considering. But you know, we know people, we know crowdfunding has a bad stigma as well, and uh, we don't want to be, we absolutely don't want to be one of these games that just throws out a bunch of ideas and hopes that we can build some hype and and you know we really have nothing to show for it, but we're going to put them out there and see if anyone will give us money. No, we want we want to operate on a shoestring budget, build as much as we possibly can on our own, and when we do go to a stage like that we want to have something that we can offer players immediately to say hey we have a real game here this is not just some ideas on paper we have a game and if you support us you can play it today it might not be polished or, or complete just yet but we have something here um, so when we ask for your money it's not just so you can follow us on Twitter for two years, and then we say, "Oh, we failed. Sorry, guys, we're shutting things down." <laughs> no, you're, you're you're gonna you're gonna get to play the game, and you're gonna get some value out of it. Uh, we don't want anyone's money until we get to that point. That's I think that's beautiful, and I think uh, you guys are definitely on the right track. I wish everybody was able to do what you guys are doing. Uh, I'm not gonna call anybody out, but I wish that we all had you know something we could play for the game that we're uh, devoting our money to, and I think that'll work out really great for you guys when you get to that point um that that's going to really set a difference it's going to be a big di a differentiator between you guys 
and some of the unfortunate ones that didn't make it or gave up, etc., that you have a game. And look, we've already spent all this time developing the game. Before we even came asking for money, we got this far, so you got something playable. You're going to get a reward today uh, for getting it. I think that's going to build. I think that's going to be huge. Um, so and Nathan, I, I just want to say this to the team and, and you on record here. <laughs> that uh, I'm I'm seriously working my butt off to get my retirement job with these guys. So that's <laughs> something I'm working for too down the road. Is how how do I uh, get my retirement position, my semi-retired position as a level designer for these guys down the road? So, but I am honestly, I say that kiddingly, but I'm really not. I mean, that would be a dream he's kidding situation. unless it happens. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it would look. You, you got to set yourself up for success in life, right? I mean, that would that's something I dream about. So I took the position and and I love the team. So yeah, that's that's seriously on my mind. All right, well, listen, guys, while we're still early in development and all that kind of thing, I want to go ahead and set up a plan with you guys uh, for the first DTN con. Um, I'd like uh, a good 10 minute puppet show uh, for the crowd. I love it. I love it. Let's do it. Hey, I got to say that I'm a big fan of yours. I, I, I mean, I've watched every single video of yours and uh, you got some interesting stuff in a comic, a comic with, you know, puppets. <laughs> thank you thank you well guys i do want to talk a little bit about crafting so a lot of people were asking questions about crafting so uh, could you guys tell us a little bit about um crafting in your game what your plans for it are um you know crafting gear versus raid gear uh, all that kind of stuff well the biggest one of the biggest issues with mmos right now is that crafting is kind of an afterthought it's thrown in it's not really fleshed out very well it usually comes to a point where it's no longer useful this is something we're really hoping to kind of rectify crafting needs to feel important it needs to be appreciated for what it is we're really hoping that w with defend the night the effort justifies the reward. So if you're a big time raider, you're no stranger to taking a week to try to figure out the strat for a boss, you know, possibly even longer. And then finally getting him for some of that just sweet, epic loop. There's no reason that a crafter who's searching for rare materials for days, weeks, maybe even several weeks, shouldn't be able to craft something of the same level. He's putting in the same amount of effort. And that's something we're really, really striving for here. Another thing with crafting is we're looking at a lot of ways that we can have crafting interact with every other aspect of gameplay. PvP, your PvE, questing, death, you know, you name it. We we're trying to find ways to where it can be useful so that no matter what you do, you can craft, you can enjoy that, and it's always going to be beneficial to you, to your friends, to your ally. That's freaking beautiful. So you were talking a little bit about uh, for PvP. Uh, so uh, would you say, like, for example, um, something like crafting for, like, siege weaponry? Um, obviously, crafting, I would think, would also tie into town building i would assume uh, mm -hmm. uh but what about let's talk a little bit about siege weaponry right so like let's say i'm a you know whatever i'm a i'm a carpenter right so i can make furniture i can make um maybe some crappy wooden swords uh for for newbies uh maybe a stretch but i i and i can make certain types of parts for uh a, you know some sort of siege gear would you make it to where you would need other people um to other types of crafters to also kind of work together to build a certain thing like a like a siege weaponry or something absolutely um i'm a little bit of a history buff and uh kind of a an ancient war lover so I'll look at this from a PvP perspective. I'm going to just go ahead and give you this claimer now. If none of this stuff is set in stone, these are just rough ideas. Sure. If you were going to lay siege to a city, you would need siege equipment. An army would usually bring a carpenter or an engineer with them. And so in terms of a game, you would seek out crafters. You would seek out a carpenter, maybe, maybe a couple of them, so that you can craft a trebuchet or a catapult or maybe a siege ladder or something to that effect, something that would make the siege go a lot easier for you. There's no reason why you couldn't, say, get carpenters to craft a catapult, but then get an alchemist to create an explosive round for it so that it would do fire damage to a door, perhaps, or maybe some sort of 
ballista that can be shot and you have a blacksmith that creates a special hook for the arrow. And you can use that and have players interact with it to eventually pull the doors off the hinges. On the defensive side, the same thing can still ring true. You're less likely to attack a town that has rows of ballista on the on the top of their walls because you know for a fact that someone's going to get hit, not going to tickle. But those ballistas are very expensive to create. Maybe they have limited ammo that you need blacksmiths to create so that they can stay in operation. Well, now suddenly PvE players are a farm. PvP players are the ones actually committed to the defense or the attack during the siege. And the crafters, they could still be in the town or they could be in the field and creating additional ammunition. Perhaps repair kits for the siege ammo that, or for the catapult that got hit by a defensive ballista. There's so many places where everything can come together. I like and we it. want to take as, as full advantage of that as we can realistically accomplish. Yeah, so what what comes to my mind immediately as you were talking was, um, uh, for example, Dark Age Camelot, I remember when people were attacking, they were like trying to break the door down, trying to get in the keep, and you know, everybody's kind of huddled up inside and uh, getting in the right positions and, and ready for it, and there would be crafters at the door constantly repairing the door, and mm -hmm. if you had good enough people and enough people there doing that at a high enough skill level, it would never end you know uh, you would have people running and grabbing more uh, uh, you know harvesting more uh, lumber for them to keep them keep their stock up and uh, you know sneaking out back doors and getting past and uh, bringing that to them keep them fueled and I, I saw in that game many times uh, armies back down because they were like they got tired of they couldn't get through the freaking door because there's too many people defending it and they didn't these people may or may not uh, even actually PvP per se versus a player, but they were involved in the effort, and that's what they liked about it. That was their joy of PvP. So, sounds like that's kind of the direction you guys are going, and I think it's a beautiful thing. Yeah, it's it's something where it's it's going to be a very enjoyable experience, but there is no reason why you should discriminate between different play styles. There is room for everybody. It might be difficult to design it may be difficult to implement but isn't it worth it to your players and to your game to try your best to fit everybody in yeah, and it makes the world uh more enjoyable and more long term i <laughs> think you know people are going to be more invested in the game um uh, if if there's these multiple avenues that they can take depending on what kind of what kind of player they are what they want to do and uh sometimes you, you you think you know what you want to do in a game and then you start playing it and you see other people doing something you're like you know i've never even enjoyed that in another game but for some reason i really respect these people doing this and i want to give it a shot you know and it, it just opens up more avenues um and, and and in the long run it creates memories and uh right that uh, there's there's also the potential of bridging the gap between pv peers and pv ears and crafters because in a lot of games there's there's a very strict divide you know there's names that go out there oh these these guys are just griefers referring to just pvpers these guys are just care bears because they're always pve but really when you look at it the people say that they're on the same side and it's the game and the systems within the game that were causing them to be separate and we're trying to bring everybody back to the same side again yeah i'll say uh, in addition to that uh, or a, a game that did that i think brilliantly was um star wars galaxies mm -hmm. you yeah. played that that i mean that game really opened my eyes and not just from a crafting perspective but just from uh professions or uh, things in addition to your just your typical combat experience that there were really players who wanted to sit in the cantina all day every day and and dance in the cantina and that was what they did they were a dancer and they you know healed other people's uh, i think it was like their mind wounds or their uh, battle wounds of some sort right by players that came in and, and sat at the cantina and the cantina and watched them dance there were players that loved that there were players like myself who had never really done any significant crafting in a game and got you know i started on the artisan path and decided at a certain point that Hey, I really want to be a master weaponsmith because that just, I, I just want to be able to make the best weapons in the game. And I had a buddy who was a bounty hunter and we had this, this, you know, this awesome relationship going where he would go out and 
and farm things for me and bring them back and i would i would advance my crafting with the things he's bringing back and then i would build him better and better weapons so he could do his job better and i would do my job better Th those sort of systems um are are a lot of fun and like i said in, not just crafting but but also just in the sort of professions that are available if you don't want to do crafting if you want to you know if you want to be a, a, a medic or you know some some other non uh, ne not necessarily gameplay re uh, uh, combat related professions. Um, so I think, uh, like Lexer said, we're we're still really in the design phase with this, but I think that might hopefully give you some insight into into what we're looking at. Um, you know, we want we want to have something for those players to do, and and it's like I said, it was surprising to me in SWG that so many of them exist i mean i know they do now and i actually became one of them in a way so um we we, we definitely want to feed that interest um, with some some really immersive professions not just uh you know something slapped on that hey you gathered a lot of ore so you may as well become a blacksmith and make something that you might use for 10 seconds and then you just wasted all your time yeah and i'm glad you brought up star wars galaxies because uh i what did no crafting when i played that game however i or any of those uh kind of things but i always felt like the world was so much cooler because when you went in the canteen is there was people dancing playing instruments i mean it, it felt insane you know it, it was it was a huge part of what made that world feel uh so vibrant and alive and cool and like you were really living in a star wars virtual universe was because of that and i'm still amazed to this day that they made their systems rewarding enough to where people would actually do that, like the dancing and things. Very interesting you brought that up because that's uh, that's something I think that is a big uh, reason people love that game so much is how they were able to implement systems and, and put them in the game and uh, whether you played that or not, you respected how cool it was that it was in the game. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, let's talk a little bit about uh, resource gathering uh, so I've been just making things up and talking about gathering lumber the whole conversation so could we talk a little bit about how you guys are gonna do that like we're we talking about infinite resources in, uh, instanced uh, looting for resources or or how, how do you guys feel about that um, there's gonna be three types uh, I mean everything's subject to change if testing warrants it because um, we like to do, we like to bring everything out for our testers. But the we have three types right now: uh, open world, which is the normal old school, go out and scavenge things, um, and then we have test scenarios, which is a three or six man group where some are instance, and then we have uh, real world drops from bosses, and, uh, mobs, and things like that. Nice. Okay. So it's a little mixture. Um... <laughs> Was it was it kind of necessary because of the building aspect? Was it kind of did you guys feel it was like super necessary to do an instance based thing so that there was it would even be possible uh, to gather the resources to be able to do anything? Well, I, I think in in some point, like you know, we talked about our zones being open world, um, but in certain aspects, I mean, there there will be you know whether it's instancing or uh, layering or sharding, whatever you want to call it. We, we certainly don't want a situation, and as much as I love EverQuest and loved, loved, loved it back in the day, the, the whole uh, situation that you got into in the end game where basically one or two guilds would just dominate all of the, uh, all of the raid mobs or all of the resources, whatever, whatever that may be at the time, that just became sort of a mess honestly and uh, so so instancing i know it can be a dirty word but there's there's something to be said for making things you know more accessible to more players now that doesn't necessarily mean that we want to make everything easy and you know everyone gets a trophy everyone gets their their dragon loot no that's not what we're saying we we don't want a, a one large guild to be able to hold all of the resources or all of the important resources uh, with whatever the current meta is to where everyone else is saying well i really wish i could you know go and contribute to the to the city war effort or whatever uh, but uh, you know the guild has it on lockdown so i can't really even help no no we we want to find ways for people to contribute um, whether that be that they have to go off in some sort of instance scenario or, or maybe even a triggered event, a world event of some type, we want to get everyone involved to some extent. Yeah, and I would also like, I mean, you guys said it, but I want to also just kind of highlight that this is very 
testing uh, phase. Uh, you guys need, um, you know, obviously data and things from uh, testing out all of these kind of uh, systems and how you're yeah. going to do that. So um, that's not something for anybody to go ahead and mark as a permanent anything at this point. So I just want to kind of highlight that. And one more thing kind of in the same realm, um, and we barely scratched the surface earlier, the survival aspects as far as like food, uh, depletion of food or other resources over time. And, and, and while you're talking about this, we could also touch on depletion of your structures you built even, if that's a thing. Yeah, this, so the food will be required, of course. Um, higher quality food will give you substantial boosts. Um, if you run out of food or water, you'll you'll uh, be able to you won't be able to generate mana or focus. If you go long enough, uh, you'll become slower. You'll move slower. We don't want to be annoying with that um, in regards to food and water either. It should feel like realistic. So if you play for an eight-hour session, you'll like consume two rations of each. I mean, there's there's a, there's a real uh, thing there that some people get really annoyed with uh, you know, having to load up on food and spend a lot of money. Um, so we want to be realistic with it. Well, let's put it this way. With the food and the water giving you bonuses, um, it's one of those things where it's it's a chance to tie in crafter. And it's going to be a very beneficial to get high quality food and water. Of course. Because there is going to be cases in an instance or during some sort of event where every every stat boost is, is going to count for something. Yeah, and it sounds too like uh, you, this is an opportunity for uh, community building, right? Uh, for, you know, uh, like we talked about earlier, uh, maybe finding a fellow community if your specific guild or, or people that you uh, play with regularly are, you know, not into that type of thing, uh, you, then you need to get out there and find another, some other people who are into that kind of thing and get them to help you out with the food uh water potions or whatever the case may be uh so it's kind of a community builder wouldn't you say exactly uh, and that's not to say that if like well, well i'll use everquest one as an example they had food and water that was kind of linked to hit point and mana regeneration and there were a lot of people who just got your standard water and bread and they were happy with that but some people when they, they went and got the higher quality stuff because it gave additional stats as well and that's that's kind of what we're drawing on here only if you neglect it and you don't have any rations we feel like you, there should be a little bit of a oh no maybe i should go get some food rather than like say i had a i had a necromancer in everquest one i don't think he had food from level 15 to 60 because he just didn't need it which didn't make a whole lot of sense All right <laughs> you know um yeah and i think yeah. there's a there's a balance of making it uh, like like scribble said where uh, you know some people can see it as annoying i mean i think that comes to that that's on us from a design standpoint uh, we our task is to not necessarily make it annoying but make it feel immersive right make it feel realistic if it feels annoying then we've done it wrong if it feels like you know hey i, I need to sort of plan my trip because that you know the world is dangerous and i need food and i need it, and it's not necessarily annoyance it just kind of goes along with the world then then we've done our job correctly yeah yeah i like it and um the uh, i have to also agree that making it actually something meaningful is kind of a big deal uh i always kind of hated it when they just made food another way to quickly get health back because i'm just sitting there in between a battle eating five thousand chicken legs and it's kind of like come on now this, there's no way this guy's eating that, this that's much Tuesday on cheap wing night <laughs> So I do like it. I think it's I think it's a cool way to bring a little bit of the survival kind of aspect to the game, and also to give some meaning, uh, which is a theme I can see in your game, uh, giving meaning to uh, merging the different kind of play styles. You know, crafting, PvP, PVE. You know, merging it all into uh, into one story, one one big community. Uh, we're having to you know reach out and. and work with and, and use one another's talent so i really like that you also you, you mentioned uh, we didn't we didn't really we kind of skipped the second part of your question there on uh buildings um oh, and sure. as far as the, the survival mechanic of, of rebuilding so um i'll just say on that and again like a, a lot of these systems are later parts of the development that we're still working out but i i like i don't think 
we will be looking at something like a full-on survival game where you know where you would walk away from your computer to go to work or to, you know to go you, you would walk away and you know your uh, homestead is still at you know it's still in the world still at risk and then you while you're afk you know someone comes and seizures it and you come back to nothing and that that's it you've got nothing you got to go find somewhere else or you you know you've lost everything essentially and there's no uh, you know no recovering it that that's not I, I don't think uh the route we're going it might be more of a hey you you opted into something so um when you are online there's an event um, that that's going to be triggered um, because you opted into it or or perhaps even you know it, maybe even if there is something that happens to your homestead or happens to your larger city that you belong to and uh, you know your city was sieged while you were away or even while you were there and, and you just lost maybe you, you don't necessarily totally lose your homestead but there's a penalty right You're, there's going to be a rebuilding cost there's going to be uh, maybe some some uh, conveniences that your city afforded you before you lost the battle that they no longer will until you rebuild and until you uh, advance it again. Um, so I think that's more of the the approach that that we'd be going with rather than you just lose everything. Um, so I want to ask you guys a question, and and I know this you might you're probably going to have to answer philosophically, and that's okay. Um, but let's say uh, there's a guild, right? I'm, let's say there's my guild, right? And uh, there's some kind of uh, there's some kind of argument or some kind of some kind of thing, some kind of dramatic thing takes place between one of my uh, members and another guild's uh, member, uh, and we decide, you know, we we need to settle this, right? Uh, and we decide to take it to war, right? And um, and I don't even uh, correct me, I may be going in territory that is completely ridiculous. But let's say we, we're going to risk it all. This is this was an infraction. We're both offended, and we're gonna we're gonna do war over it. And um, first of all, before I continue with this scenario that I'm making up, uh, is that is it is that even a possible thing where we could like pit our towns against each other in a guild versus guild type scenario? Yes. Okay. I was gonna uh, sit here waiting for someone to go. Hell yeah! <laughs> all right. Well, I love that. Yeah, you could definitely do it through factions, uh, changing your factions. Yeah. Well, it's like let's let's think of it like this, um, and I'll, I'll even hit the last question with this too. You know, a large town takes a lot of resources just to maintain. On top of that, if you want to expand, you have to gather even more resources. So, if you were to lose a battle through, we'll say maybe a PVE event or even a PVP event, the repair costs are going to be a major setback, especially if you were looking to expand. It could potentially even set you back to the maintenance cost of your town to where maybe you kind of get downgraded a little bit because you don't make your maintenance you just can't afford it that's not to say it's going to take you months and months and months to get back there but it's still like it's a little drop well let's say let's let's say since there's going to be a risk in doing this so it's not going to be something people take lightly um it's not going to be something people um you know do out of a whim it'll be a serious you know probably I would I would assume the guild would probably want to get together and discuss it first. Like, guys, this is what we really want to do. Are we gonna are we gonna accept the uh, the challenge, or are we going to declare war? And but let's just say here's what I wanted to really find out. Let's say I decide, yeah, this is good. You know, the guild agrees we're going to war, and so I declare war. They accept, and it's I don't I, I would assume there'd be a period of time to prepare, uh, and then. When I, we get there, right, and, and, I, and we're ready, we think, you know, we're all excited, but we look up, and like you mentioned before, there were ju- there just got piles of siege weaponry, right, just pointed right at us, mm-hmm. and we're just like, oh, geez, okay, didn't realize it was this serious, we're going to take a big hit, one we really can't afford, uh, can you surrender and just maybe sacrifice something of value, uh, in-game currency or something just say hey we don't want to take that big of a hit we surrender uh or something like that as as a designer i I look to real life for a lot of inspiration in my mind surrendering is something that should definitely be considered because there are going to be instances where you know not to say it's happened to me but someone runs their mouth and starts a war um and then you realize you bit off way more than you can chew but i bet it's happened to you (laughs) <laughs> Every day that, that ends in Y. Uh, but um, there are some games out there where you can just cancel within, say, 
eight hours of starting a war. Well, that that gets to be a disruption in people's play sessions because the people who were attacking or defending in this war, they might be scrambling to get everything together to only to have it canceled. But it also leaves room to troll people where, oh, I'm declaring war. And then at, you know, seven hours and 59 seconds, you cancel. We don't want something like that to happen. So a surrender, uh, a surrender option seems like a very good fit, but it would have to be something where if you were to surrender, you would have to give them some reason. Yeah, I like it. So you do still sacrifice something, but if you realize, look guys, we're gonna lose really bad and we're going to, this is gonna, this is gonna set us back quite a bit. I would rather just surrender, lose, uh, you know, 10% of what we would have lost uh, from from surrendering, then uh, go through with this and make fools right. of ourselves. I mean, a loss is still a loss, right? And and a loss needs to come with some some sort of drawback. Yeah, I, I, I really like that. That was like the first one way back when we were first. You mentioned the, the all the siege weaponry all lined up. That was what came to my mind. So I was really excited to get to talk about that, um, guys. Real quick before we wrap up, that was a ton of information. I think this is probably going to be the most informative video I've ever released um, and very exciting stuff guys but I do while I've got you all here I would like to hear you guys kind of talk about your inspirations you know for for this game in particular because a lot of people are, are, are referring to EverQuest, Ultima Online, uh, Shadowbane just what what was the inspiration for this game what really got you guys individually or, or guides you when you're developing this game? I'll go first. Um... I use every game I've ever played as inspiration because just because the game was not very enjoyable doesn't mean you can't take inspiration from it. You can see what they've done, try to figure out why it wasn't enjoyable and learn. On the flip side, games like EverQuest that quite literally saved my life, it wouldn't, it's it's only fair to try to pay homage to them, to kind of pay it forward the best we can. And that's, there's, there's honestly hasn't been a game out there I haven't played. So I'll say for me, um, the, the the big ones there would definitely be EverQuest, um, which I started playing you know, right shortly after launch, I think in early 2000 maybe, um, and then jumped into Star Wars Galaxies uh, several years later, I think three or four years later, and then World of Warcraft after that. So the, those three would be the big ones. Um, EverQuest, obviously the, the community, of it, it was my my first MMORPG. I mean, is I think I believe the first 3D MMORPG after uh, with Meridian 59 and Ultima. So, um, just just absolutely blew my mind. I'd never even envisioned that type of game, and got recruited to it by a friend, and and never looked back. And then Star Wars Galaxies, like we we mentioned earlier, just the the sandbox elements were just something I'd never experienced, and that that's really stuck with me. Um, I don't think that has really been matched in a game since then, which is which is really sad. But um, so, I mean, that's it, that's that one's a very unique game that did a lot of things right. I think they made some stumbles with some expansions. Um, they're notorious uh, for really changing the game, but but early on, that one was just um, there's a there's a lot to be learned from from what they did well with their sandbox elements and their crafting. Um, and then World of Warcraft, I mean, love it or hate it, the game is an absolute behemoth. Um, you know, Blizzard, the, the polish and, and accessibility that they put into that game obviously just changed everything. Um, I know a lot of us would say it's sort of watered down the genre, but they've, they also did a lot of things right. And, and you have to remember that a lot of their devs as well came from EverQuest. There were people who came from EverQuest who saw the flaws with EverQuest and looked to write it with with Vanilla WoW, um, and and a lot of the decisions they made were, um, you know, they, there, there's a reason why that game you know got up to 12 million players or whatever whatever it was. Um, so yeah, I, th I think there's a lot to learn from all three. I loved all three in their own ways. Um, and and so I I mean I guess well, that's a lot to say. I love classic you know sort of the classic game design now we do want to bring a modern flavor to uh defend the night you know we don't want you people to be doing hour-long corpse runs and losing half a day's of worth of xp uh when they die and and just i know a lot of us don't have time for that maybe don't have the attention span for that anymore um with the the state of the of, of gaming today 
um, but we, we want the world to be feared and and uh, we want people to really feel that sense of danger um, like like they you know used to in some of the classic designed games um, and you're, you're gonna see that in defend the night so uh, obviously I think I said it before EverQuest was my ultimate game as far as inspiration um, I'm, I'm hoping I'm not the only one but I still think I, you know it's weird but sounds to me like having the right sounds and noises in a game like like is I think highly uh, underestimated of how important it is so uh, give you a good example like the night noises in Firat or you know some of the noises you get in Desert of Row you know some of these places in EverQuest um, where you could just go sit down and not have to do anything and just watch the the, the liveliness of the world and in combination with that it's that feeling where even if you're sitting out in the desert of row there's a chance that a rare spawn can happen um you know or the oasis there's this chance that causal can come in and, and kick your ass you know if you're sitting on the dock or that's that's the things i miss is in most games you can sit there and not feel that because it's not built that way so i'm really pushing for dynamic and situational gameplay that's my inspiration and i think that's absolutely what's missing uh rare spawns are key to that key you know events rare events um i think dynamic situations within the game world is absolutely key to getting that immersion and, and that is absolutely what inspires me so and there's something like i i know i can go log into a p99 or you know an everquest game right now and still have that feeling because of the way that's built so anyway so that that's super important to me yeah although it's had its problems um and we're not trying to recreate those problems i am a, a pretty large uh, shadow bane fan and you've probably uh people have probably probably said that uh, the game kind of reminds you of that what the city's built city aspect is everquest of course was my favorite mmorpg uh i also want to say that i and a lot of the other developers are uh, big age of empires 2 uh, fans so you'll see a lot of um, that inspiration uh, when, when we design these city systems. On staff, we have uh, many uh, Final Fantasy XI fans and uh, EverQuest Online Adventure fans, uh, as well as we have a, a, a lore person that does a lot of, a lot of design all in, and she is a big EverQuest and EverQuest 2 fan. So I'm sure you'll see a lot of uh, uh, thought bubbles uh, of those games rise to the top uh, and defend the night. Yeah, it's, it's amazing to see the reach of EverQuest. I mean, a lot of people, like, it, it, even in World of Warcraft, uh, you have people that, you know, they they may, it, the people that love WoW that that don't, uh, or maybe even love, like, retail WoW, but they, they don't uh, care too much about the old school games. It's it, just have no idea that basically all of those ideas came from EverQuest. All of those original designers came from EverQuest. They were big time raiders in EverQuest. So right. the, just the reach of that game is unbelievable. Well, guys, I really appreciate you guys coming together for me and um, doing this interview. I think this was really awesome. Um, uh, it was also good to get to talk to you guys and get to know you a little better. And very awesome to, hit, to get to hear about uh, your your game, Defend the Night. I'm super excited about it. You have a big fan here. So anytime, I will make my schedule open that you guys want to uh, get a couple of us together and run that uh, dungeon that you had me salivating at the mouth over. Uh, you let me know. I will clear my schedule immediately, and we will do that whenever you guys are ready and want to show that off. Yeah, I think it's like a it, deal to me. It's a deal here. Hey, you're still in NDA, so you come in soon, actually. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Listen to what I say. I've been making videos all day My friends all say I'm It's a video buffet You can even hit replay But please just subscribe I can't even describe Being part of my tribe I'll even offer you a prize But just please just subscribe and hit the bell notification too.